Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Um, I'm Anne Burrows. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the president and CEO of the Japanese American National Museum, and I'm delighted. I'm just delighted to welcome all of you here this evening, and thank you for coming to join us for this really important program this afternoon, which in many respects is the centerpiece of our opening festivities for reaffirmed commitment, our new display that commemorates the 30th anniversary of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988. So the signing of that act was an extraordinarily powerful moment in this, in this nation's history, because it's when its leadership had the courage to look the terrible wrong of the incarceration squarely in its eyes and to name it for what it was, and to apologize to Japanese Americans and to the nation as a whole for the great injustice that it had wrought on its own citizens. And to mark this anniversary, and to celebrate the accomplishment it represents that was so many years in the making and that involved countless individuals and organizations. We've reimagined the final gallery of our common ground, the Heart of Community exhibition, to place an even stronger emphasis on the redress movement, its influences, and its very, very important his historic significance. And as we began to think about this, and as we began to think about what this might look like, we realized that there was no one better to help us think about that and curate the display and the exhibition, and in, in fact, the, the entire shaping around our festivities to commemorate this, than Mitch Markey, who is the president and CEO of Go For Broke. So Mitch, I'm just so deeply grateful to you for agreeing to be our co-curator and for the enormous expertise and knowledge that you've brought to it, and also for the amount of time that you've given up in helping to make this happen. And I'd also like to acknowledge John Isaki, who's probably again hiding outside the room. John, where is John? There he is. <laughs> John and Mitch have co-curated the display that you'll see upstairs. So it's been a wonderful collaboration. It's also been a collaboration that's been, like so many things at Janum when we put together exhibitions, that becomes an all-hands-on-deck approach. Almost every single department at Janum has been involved, a lot of staff, and certainly many of our volunteers. So on behalf of all of us, just such sincere thanks to all of you. So when you go up to look at the display, if you haven't done so already, among the things that you'll see in that last and final gallery are the two original pages of the Civil Liberty Act. And these include the page that bears President Ronald Reagan's signature, as well as those of Senator Spark Matsunaga and Janum's own Chair of the Board of Trustees, Norman Netta. I'm also delighted to announce but it's probably not a surprise to you, for those of you who've already seen it, but that the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library has very generously loaned us the original pen that President Reagan used to sign the act. So that you will see too when you go upstairs. And finally, I have the great pleasure of introducing, I don't even have to introduce him because he, everybody in the room knows him, but Stephen Kagawa, Stephen Kagawa, who's both, both the chairman of Go For Broke Board of Directors, as well as a member of the Board of Trustees of Janum. Stephen, over to you. Thank you so much. Let's give Ann Burles a big round of applause. Hey. It really takes great leadership, and we're really blessed to have hers here at the Japanese American National Museum. And on behalf of the Board of Trustees and all the volunteer leadership at the Japanese American National Museum, I want to welcome you to the gathering place of Little Tokyo, right here, you know, where acro across the way is a historic building where Go For Broke National Education Center resides. Um, it's, it's an amazing time, and this is an amazing program especially when two national organizations can come together to go ahead and share what's really important, the histories, the lessons to share with all of us and the rest of the world. So I want to welcome all of you to the reaffirmed commitment, a conversation with our own Norm Mineta. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> Thank you. 
So uh, you heard a little bit about an ex exhibit upstairs at Common Ground, the, and it's really exciting. Uh, the the uh, the things that you will see there firsthand, the pen, as you heard. And across the way uh, at Gold for Broke National Education Center, you'll see uh, some in, on, in their uh, exhibit called HR442, Nisei Veterans and the Fight for Civil Liberties. You're going to see clips of Nisei Soldier and Color of Honor, um, documentaries that uh, uh, Norm Mineta, who was then Representative Mineta, and Spark Matsunaga were arranging to play uh, for Congress in 1988. So you get, really got to see both of the exhibits to get the whole thing. And I'm really excited about that collaboration because I come from Hawaii, where we were bombed. And, I did, and, I, and yet, and where I used to hear all the time, go for broke, screamed out. And I used to do it in the backyard with my little G.I. Joe men. You guys ever do that? That's what I was doing. And I never really even understood what I was saying, except give it all, give it all you got, right? And then I, 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 I'm listening about these incarcerations and whatnot and find out that there's all these people that get stuck behind barbed wire where guns are pointed in instead of out. And then I learned that one of the 800 that went from Hawaii to these camps, to Jerome, Arkansas, included my own family. And had it not been for this institution and the institution that resides across the plaza, I wouldn't know. And because I do know, because they have shared, I want to dedicate part of my life and commit it to sharing this story with the, with the rest of the world. And because of you and everything that you do, all the, all the contributions you make, the time that you give, I can do so. So let's give all of ourselves a hand for promoting this story, sharing it with the rest of the world. So let's get right to it. And, and, and you all know Norm Mineta, and we're all excited to hear your words and your stories, what uh, we uh, fondly call Hanashi across the way. And yet um, in Hawaii, we call it talk story. So I'm really listening to, to hear some talk story over here. And, and I'm really excited to introduce another great leader in our community, and that's Dr. Mitch Maki. Let's give Mitch Maki a hand. <laughs> So Mitch has really taken on the role as a chief executive officer to heart at Gopher Broke National Education Center. And he's going out there and really sharing that story and really exciting. He's also the lead author of Achieving the Impossible Dream. Um, uh, so so we, Mitch is also, as you heard, uh, the co-curator with John Isaki on the revitalization of common ground. So with all that, because I'm standing in the way. Let's get these guys on stage. Dr. Mitch Maki. Welcome, everyone. And thank you, Stephen. And thank you, Ann, for that kind introduction. We're in for a great afternoon. Um, Norm, don't get nervous. It's just you and me and 200 of your closest friends here tonight. And you know, as, as I was thinking about what we wanted to cover here today, and I was thinking of Representative Mineta's life, Secretary Mineta's life, and really our friend Norm Mineta's life, I realized that in many ways, you are the Japanese American political Forrest Gump. <laughs> you name it, in Japanese American history, Norm was there, right? <laughs> World War II and the camps, Norm was there. After the war, we need a political, political leadership. He becomes the first Japanese-American mayor. Norm was there. Redress, Norm was there. 9-11, uh, Norm was there. So, Norm, you truly are the uh, Japanese-American political Forrest Gump. And, <laughs> and like we always say, life is like a box of manju. So let's... Let, <laughs> Let's get into your manju right now. And just, just a bit of warning, the last time Norm and I got together, we literally had a four hour dinner just talking story. So we're gonna, we're gonna have a lot of stories to, to share. So let's start from the beginning, you know, born and raised in San Jose. What are some of your earliest memories of San Jose growing up with your family? Well, first of all, uh, let me express to all of you uh, for taking time from your own very busy schedules to be here. 
I know you'd rather be doing laundry or vacuuming or mowing the lawn or something, but I really appreciate your uh, being here today because one of the things that we must do all the time is to be vigilant in the protection of our constitution, constitutional rights. And to we don't have to be vigilantes, but we have to be vigilant in the protection of our constitutional rights and keep a focus on what happened to 120,000 people in 1942. I mean, that's less than 1% of the population at the time. And yet, uh, <clears throat> all of you are willing to take some time to make sure that the focus <clears throat> is, is here on what happened uh, as a result of Executive Order 9066 uh, and this uh, tragic episode of, of what happened to these people. First of all, let me introduce uh, my wife, Denny Manetta, here in front. I, um, I have had a wonderful life and she has contributed so much in my enabling, enabling to do a lot of these things. Well, first of all, Mitch, I, I chose very carefully the family that I was born into. <laughs> um, great father, and Issei, who came from Japan in 19, 1902 at the age of 14 by himself. Great mother, who was a picture bride in 1912, and then uh, came to the United States uh, after my dad saved enough money for her travel and came in 1914. Three older sisters, an older brother, and uh, I was the youngest of the five. And in fact, uh, between my oldest sister and me, uh, there was an 18 year difference. So I was born in November 31, and she went off to Berkeley at, in uh, September of 1932, so I didn't really get to know her until later on in life. But uh, for me, life was great at 545 North 5th Street in San Jose, um, just growing up like any ordinary kid might at that time. And so if we get right into the story, December 7th happens. And what's your recollection of what happens right after December 7th? Well, <clears throat> we came home from church about 12, 15, 12, 30. And my mother used to love to listen to music on the radio. So she had the radio on uh, listening to music. And then, of course, we break into the program to make this announcement. And, um, you know, being 10 years old um, it really had very little significance. And yet the phone at our home started ringing a lot, people calling my dad to find out what's, what's happening in Hawaii and how is that going to impact on, on the rest of us. And people would drop by the office or by our home, and my dad was in the insurance business, and when he built that home, he built an office in the front of the house. So people were coming by to talk to my dad about what the impact would be on everybody from what we were hearing on, uh, on the radio that day. And <clears throat> we had a hallway that led to the office, and there was a glass door with a curtain there. And so I sat on the floor right behind that door, trying to listen to all the conversations as people were coming to the house to talk to my father. And you were a 10-year-old at this time. You had just turned 10 years old. Is that right? Right. And then you tell the story about your neighbor, a young girl coming over and, and 
sharing the news that her father had been taken away. Tell us that story. Well, next door, uh, or between the two houses, we had a hedge. And then at the bottom, uh, we were, there was a little cutout so that Irving could come over, Joyce could come over, or I could go over there and just crawl through the hedge. And uh, about uh, 1.30, 2 o'clock, Joyce comes running in through the back door of our house uh, yelling, the police are taking Papa away, the police are taking Papa away. So my dad runs out of the front of the house, runs next door, and Mr. Hirano is gone already. So he asked Mrs. Hirano, who took him away? I have no idea. Irving, who was about 14, uh, 15, uh, Irving, do you know who took him away? I have no idea who it was. But all of a sudden here, somebody had taken Mr. Hirano away. So my dad called the city manager and said, you know, what's going on? He says, well, I have no idea what you're talking about. Call the chief of police. So he called the chief of police and he said, Mr. Mineta, he says, I, I have no idea what you're talking about, but I think you ought to call Sheriff Emick. So my dad called Sheriff Emick and uh, the sheriff said, well, I know what's going on. It's not my operation. It's the FBI. So I'll call the FBI to have them come and call or call you as to what they're doing. Well, about 4 o'clock, the special agent in charge of the San Jose office uh, came to the house. And he explained that they were picking up people who were sympathetic to the Japanese effort. Well, who were they? Konko Kyokai priest, Book Kyokai priest. Uh, Mr. Hirano was the executive secretary of the Nihon Jingai, the Japanese association, it's a social organization. And the big thing they used to put on was a great picnic in the spring of every year. But here, Mr. Hirano was taken away. And so the special agent in charge we're saying we're taking away people who are... <coughs> this is microphone making me cough. <laughs> uh, so the um, special agent said we're picking up people who are sympathetic to the Japanese effort and community leaders. Well, my dad thought he was a community leader. <laughs> and and they weren't coming to pick him up. And so he was a little insulted that, <laughs> that he wasn't being taken away. But after the FBI agent left, my mother and father packed a suitcase just in case uh, they came, they would come back. But they never did. They never came. <laughs> what, what do you remember about the few months before your family was shipped off? Well. The big thing to me was, uh, you know, Executive Order 9066 was signed by President Roosevelt, and soon after that, all these placards would start going up. They were posted on utility poles, sides of buildings, and it just said, instructions to all those of Japanese ancestry, alien and non-alien. And as a 10-year-old kid, I looked at that, and I said to my brother, who's a non-alien? He said, that's you. I said, I'm not a non-alien. I'm a citizen of the United States of America. He says, well, non-alien is the same as being a citizen uh, under, this, uh, under this context. And that's why to this day, I cherish the word citizen because our own government, my own government, was not willing to look at us as citizens of the United States of America. Now, when's the last time you got up on a chair, beat your chest and said, I'm a proud non-alien of the United States of America? I don't think you have. And that's why to this day, I still cherish the word citizen because my own government wasn't willing to use that to describe all of us who were born here in the United States. You know, I remember one time you and I were talking and I was telling you about a friend of mine, Jeff, 
who was from Arcadia, and Denny was with us, and you responded, oh, I lived in Arcadia. And I looked at you and said, you never lived in Arcadia. Well, you're from San Jose, you went to Washington, D.C. When did you live in Arcadia? When did you live in Arcadia? From May 30th, 1942 to November 6th of 1942. And what was even better, one time as a member of Congress, uh, we, had, we were on a congressional delegation and met here in L.A. And uh, we were then invited as guests to go to Santa Anita. So here I am in the owner's box at uh, Santa Anita. And the owner said, uh, have you ever been to Santa Anita? Uh, see a race? <laughs> and I said, no, I've never been here to see a race. I lived here. And I thought he was going to drop his teeth <laughs> on the spot. And so oh, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, sorry. And I said, no, no, no I understand. But uh, I said, I was fortunate. By the time we got here on May 30th, all the stables were filled up. So we got to live in the barracks buildings in the parking lot. And, um, but I used to go visit my friends uh, in the horse stables. And I don't know how, it was some months, May, June, July, August, how they stood being able to live in those stables. Ostensibly, they said, oh, yeah, we cleaned them up. But the stench was so bad, I don't know how uh, people. And you know, as kids, we would wear a guitar and get together and then go take a shower at the paddock. Let's see, I think I'll take a shower with Man of War tonight. <laughs> or Sea Biscuit. Or, you know, at the paddock, they install these showers heads, no stalls, but just put in shower heads. And so we get to take a shower with a different horse every yeah. night. And you also told me the story of how as a kid, a 10-year-old now, you would look through the gates and you would see the movie theater. Oh, right across the street from us was the Arcadia Theater. And we'd sit there by the, by the fence and we they didn't have the lights on because during World War II, they just turned off all the arcade lights and they'd feature all the films, thinking, man, sure wish we could go see the movie, but never did. And then I remember when the military police and the <clears throat> Arcadia Police Department came in to start going through the barracks buildings to see if they could find contraband articles, like irons and even just common radios. Uh, and uh, a big uh, riot occurred, and a bunch of us, Eddie Kimura, Richard Onisha, a whole bunch of us were down at uh, Anita Chiquita, the uh, practice uh, uh, horse race area. <clears throat> And men, pretty soon you hear bullets. And so, men, I mean, we just got out of there real quickly. But that was um, about probably uh, July of 42 when they had those big riots, mm -hmm. you know, when uh, people were trying to confiscate these, quote, contraband articles. So you never got to see a movie in Arcadia? No. All right. Uh, that's I'll our... tell you, the other thing that, went, that was really bothered me was that... Oh, We're going to try a third microphone now. <laughs> You're wearing them out. <laughs> I started eating these. Um, but I remember when I boarded the train, I was in a Cub Scout uniform, baseball, baseball glove, baseball bat. And as I got on the train, the MPs took my bat. And I said, you can't do that. He said, no, it could be used as a lethal weapon. So they took my bat away. And I was running to my father and said, the MPs took my bat away. And he said, it's all right, we'll, we'll get you another one. Well, there were no stores in Santa Anita. 
So I never did get a bat, but you know, you pick up a stick about the size, like a bat, and hit a ball. But I'll tell you, when the bat hits the ball, it stings your hand. Man, so, you know, never got to play baseball again. Still, and I love best baseball, but uh, never, we never saw a bat uh, the rest of the time in San Juan. And I know there's a follow-up story to that, but we're going to save that toward the end of the uh, discussion here today. But my promise to you is next time you come to L.A., we're going to Santa Anita, we're going to watch a movie <laughs> at, at the Santa Anita Mall. <laughs> Put it on the bucket list there. Okay. Uh, then he knows how to read the right racing form. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I look at the horse and say, well, that's, those are nice colors. I think I'll bet on that horse. <laughs> So you and your family went up to Hard Mountain, and you spent the next three years of your life there. What, are, what were some of the memories that you have of Hard Mountain? Well, the first memory I have is getting there. We arrived at Hard Mountain, were let off the train, and the wind was just blowing like crazy, and colder than blazes. I mean, here we are, just with light shirts, light jackets, and this tremendous wind, and this silk and fine sand just peppering our faces, and tumbleweed and sagebrush um, being blown away. So when we got to our barracks, uh, it was full of silk, because you know the floorboards are not put together very well, and the sand was coming up, sand was coming in through the windows, and uh, it was just colder than blazes. And uh, so here we are in November, and the schools didn't open until March. So the elders were really concerned about what are we gonna do with the young people? So they wrote to the Boy Scouts of America and Girl Scouts, said, please come and organize troops. So um, uh, I became a Boy Scout. And our scout leaders would write to the Boy Scout troops in uh, Deaver, Ralston, Powell, Cody, all those other towns surrounding the camp. Said, come on in and join us for our jamboree. They would write back and they said, oh, no, no, we're not going in there. There's barbed wire around. There are uh, military guard towers every 300 feet, searchlights and machine gun mounts. Uh, they're POWs. We're not going in there. No, no, these, these uh, are not POWs. They're Boy Scouts of America. They wear the same uniform you do. They read the same manual you do. They go after the same merit badges you do. But they never came in. Uh, and then one day, uh, it was announced that the Boy Scout troop from Cody was going to come in. So they came in and we did our, you know, not tying contest, woodworking, how to start a fire without a match, all the things that Boy Scouts do. Uh, and then we got paired off with a kid from the Boy Scout troop in Cody to put up our tent. So this kid and I put up our tent, but you know, in Wyoming it could rain a lot anytime. So you have to build a moat, a moat around your, your tent protected from the water. So this kid and I were building our boat around the tent. And then he said, there's a kid from my troop in that tent below us. I really don't care for him. Would you mind if we cut the water to exit that <laughs> You don't skin off my nose, so said, sure. So we build a beautiful boat, cut the water, exit to go that way. And as the luck would have it, it started raining. And the boat worked very well. The water went to the tent below us. Pretty soon that tent, the tent pegs pulled and the tent came down. Kids in my tent going, ha ha ha, ha ha ha, he he And I finally said to Alan, would you please shut up so we can get some sleep? And that was Alan Simpson. So through junior high school, high school, college, Every so often we'd write each other a note. And uh, so next time I got a note from 1971, 
I was the elected mayor and Associated Press had a small story. And in that story said, Mineta was one of 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry interned in camps during World War II. His family was at Heart Mountain, Wyoming. So the Cody Enterprise printed that story. Alan was practicing law at Cody. I then got a note. Said, Dear Norm, congratulations on being elected mayor. You remember me? I was that fat, fat little roly bully kid in that tent with you. And, uh, so 1974, I get elected to the House. In 1978, he got elected to the Senate. And our friendship went back as if we were still sitting in that pup tent in 1943. And uh, so Denny and I and Ann and Alan, you know, we twice a year would go on vacations, have a great time. And uh, all because you were two rascal kids <laughs> in a pup tent in 1943, 1944, or something like that. Well, he, he called me pesky. <laughs> I'm Pes still not sure what I mean. Pesky? Yeah, I'm not sure what it means. That's a great nickname for you. <laughs> <laughs> and for those of you who don't can you, really... Can you use that word in polite company? <laughs> <laughs> we will now. <laughs> for those of you who may not realize, Alan Simpson was a very conservative Republican senator in the Senate when redress passed, and he actually voted for the bill. And normally, he may have been against uh, something like this, but because of the friendship that he had with Norm back from those World War II days, you know, he, he didn't stand in the way of the bill being passed. So, you know, now, you gotta admit, that, that scene's gotta be in the Forrest Gump Japanese American political movie <laughs> that we're gonna make it right? It doesn't, it wouldn't occur today. You know, when Alan and I are still the best of friends, but you don't find that kind of a relationship in the House and Senate today. Mm -hmm. Especially across party, across chambers, it, it, quite, a, quite a story. And they're so polarized, uh, they don't even talk to each other or know each other. Right. Well, we're going to get to that because I know you have some thoughts about how we can address the polarization going on in Washington, D.C. I know that when, when your family left the camp, there was a story in People magazine about in, uh, that came out in the 80s about how your family left the camp and that you and your siblings and your mother stopped at a diner uh, right outside of the camps. Tell us about that moment and what that moment meant for you. Uh, well, my dad being an East Bay had come to love this country and I only saw him cry three times. Once it was December 7th, because he couldn't understand why the land of his birth was now attacking the land of his heart. Secondly, it was May 29, 1942, when we were on the train pulling out of San Jose. Uh, and at that point, we didn't know where we were going, and it turned out to be San Anita. But uh, I looked at him, and all of his tears were coming down. And then 1999. 56 when my mother passed away. But he wanted to do something to help in the war effort. So he finally ended up at the University of Chicago teaching Japanese under the Army Specialized Training Program, ASTP. So he had asked for my mother and me to leave with him to go to Chicago. And the Army said, no, uh, you go alone. So my dad left in April of 43 to go to Chicago. And towards the end of November, then the army said to my mother and me, okay, you can leave to go to Chicago. So we uh, went down to the highway right out to the camp and got on a trailways bus and went from Hart Mountain to Deaver. And at Deaver, we caught the train to Billings. And uh, so my mother had, we got there about one o'clock and our train was gonna come through Billings at about midnight. So my mother got a room at the hotel and then we went to the dinner uh, restaurant right next door to the hotel and uh, 
got through with my meal, and I started stacking the dishes. And my mother says, no, ma, you don't have to do that anymore. Because you know how in camp you had to stack all your dishes, take it over to where they were, where the dishwashers were. So she said, no, ma, you don't have to do that anymore. So that was a revelation uh, about what life was, out, was like outside camp. And in that moment, you knew that you were free. We were outside the camp. Right. Let's fast forward. Uh, what made you decide to go into public service and into seeking first the being mayor of San Jose? Well, um, in high school, my father had been in the life insurance business from 19, 1920. So in high school, he said, I want you, I want you to join the business and I said, no, no, Papa, I want to be an aeronautical engineer. So I started at Berkeley as an engineering student until I took calculus. <laughs> I, I decided for the safety of the country <laughs> and my own future, I better find something else to do. The School of Business Administration at Berkeley, just juniors and seniors. So the first two years, you have to take other courses, whatever it might be. So I thought I'd take economics. So I took economics in the College of Letters and Science. Found it, it's all math again. <laughs> and I thought, man, I'm not even going to see an AA degree, much less get into the School of Business Administration. But I, I stuck with economics and got through it all. But, you know, it, uh, so here I am in the insurance business. After I came back from overseas, the uh, Korean War, stationed in, in Japan for a year and a half, and then came back, joined him in the insurance business. And in 1976, <clears throat> we had a directly elected mayor in San Jose, first time. And so uh, uh, a member of the city council ran for mayor, was elected. So there was a vacancy on the city council. So the new mayor and two, <coughs> two incumbent members of the city council came to me and said, hey, put your name in for city council because we're going to fill that vacancy by appointment. And I said, well, I'm in business with my father, so I better talk to him about it first. So when I talked to my father, he said, you know, we can manage how we run the insurance business. Uh, we can discuss that and decide on our own. But he said, in Japan, there's an old adage that if you're in politics, you're like that nail sticking out of the board. And he says, you know what happens to that nail? It gets hammered. Now, do you think you can afford to be hammered by your friends, your neighbors, your constituents, whomever? And I said, well, Papa, it's only for a two-year unexpired term. And I can still be active in the insurance business. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I'd like to try it. So I submitted my name and, and then got selected to fill that vacancy. So. It was for a two-year unexpired term, and then in 19, that was 67, and then 1969, and then had to seek a four-year term uh, because I was enjoying it. And uh, so I got into politics by accident, by the easiest way, by appointment, appointment. to the city council. So when I ran and 1969 for a four-year term, you know, I couldn't say retain uh, or re-elect Norm because I was never elected in the first place. So we use the phrase retain Norm. Retain the, Norm. Oh, council. I like that. Retain yeah. Norm. Retain, we should retain Pesky. Nah. <laughs> <And that's, laughs> there you go again. <laughs> so then you, you get to Congress in 74. Yeah. 
freshmen in, in the halls of, of Congress. What are your memories about that? Well, there were two things especially that I loved. One was Congresswoman Patsy Mink took me under her wings. And the other was Spark Matsunaga. Spark was, uh, Sparky was a member of the House Rules Committee. So he gave me his copy of the House of Representatives manual and said, I want you to you know, learn the rules of this place. And he was very meticulous about knowing about the rules and how to get things done. And he was a great teacher for me. And uh, Patsy was terrific as a mentor. Again, uh, she was more on the political side. Uh, Sparky was more on the, on the rules mm -hmm. of the House. Mm -hmm. But the two of them, without a doubt, really uh, took me under, under their wings and helped me learn about the House. Now, if you had said to me when I was in Heart Mountain, you know, in uh, April 19, uh, 75, you're going to have lunch with the president of the United States. I would have had you committed to the funny farm. <laughs> and uh, yet here in April 1975, after I got elected uh, to the House of Representatives, I was elected the chairman of the new members caucus. These were uh, 75 Democratic new members. And so here I am having lunch at the White House with President Jerry Ford, mm -hmm. and you know, looking around, thinking, "What am I? What's a little kid like you from San Jose doing in a place like this?" And it was just amazing to uh, be at the White House in uh, 1975. Do you have memories of when uh, President Ford revoked 9066? Absolutely, and uh, I was there when he signed that that resolution or his proclamation. Yeah. So right away, when you hit the, the halls of Congress, being Japanese American, there were, some, there were some connections. Patsy Mink reached out to you, Senator Matsunaga. During your career, were, were there any moments where you were mistaken for a, another Japanese American? Well, I, I remember when uh, I was at a meeting of it's called Apex, but it has to do with the uh, Israeli American uh, politics. And uh, this fellow said to me, Senator, you know, I want to really thank you for all the great work you do on behalf of Israel. And um, I'll also remember <coughs> uh, Senator Phil Hart of uh, Michigan passed away, and his funeral uh, was in the early part of December of uh, 1975, and snowing, it was a mess. So I came into the church, and the usher came over and said, Senator, we have a seat for you up front. <laughs> and uh, I said, no, no, I, I was a little late. So I said, no, no, that's all, I'll stand back, stand back here. And I took off my coat. And uh, so he came over to, to say, I'll, I'll take you up front. And then I, when I extended my right hand, I thought he was going to fall over and <laughs> fall over in a faint. Because he realized then that this is not Senator Inouye. <laughs> and uh, so, no, there were a lot of times. And I remember we had a steak dinner with uh, the Japanese delegation that was at the White House. And uh, then they separated the US delegation and some of the higher ranking Japanese delegation to go into the state dining room. And uh, so I went over to the state dining room side, but Spark got escorted to the East Room where the uh, others were having dinner. And so here's uh, the um, Secretary of State. Shoot, I'm in charge now. Who was that? 
Oh, uh, Haig. Haig, General Haig. So here's Sparky coming through the line, and uh, he's, here's General Haig, Secretary Haig, saying, nice to have you here, thank you very much. And Sparky says, well, Secretary Haig, I'm Senator Spark Matsunaga. Oh my gosh, and he finally called somebody over to have Spark taken over <laughs> to the state dining room side. So, but, uh, no, there weren't, uh, there were a couple of times, but th those are, you know, just incidental. And, uh, but Spark had been, actually been directed over to the East Dining Room. And uh, so when uh, General Haig was, was introduced or he saw him, he was really surprised. Right. <laughs> so you hit the halls of Congress right around the time that we're in the community, we're starting to talk about redress starting to understand that something happened 30 years prior and maybe we should get an apology, maybe we should get redress for that. What were your initial thoughts when you would hear people talking about that concept? Well, I first heard about um, redress after the 76 election and there was a congressman from Washington by the name of Mike Lowry who introduced the first redress bill. And I'm wondering, who's this guy, Mike Lowry? And what's he doing introducing this redress bill? Well, it was Cherry Kinoshita of Seattle. She was the president of the Seattle JCL. And she had convinced Mike that this is something that's very important. Well, in 1978, the National JCL had their convention and they adopted as a result of Edison Uno's work, a one sentence resolution that said, we're going to undertake a legislative program to seek an apology from the US Congress and redress payments of $25,000. And so in April of 1979, the officers and staff came to see Senator Inouye, Senator Spark Matsunaga, Congressman Bob Matsui, who had just been elected in November of 76, and myself, to talk about their legislative program. And Dan said, man, you guys are asking tall order of us. And he said, unless public, and the public doesn't know about this, and unless the public knows about it, members of the Senate and the members of the House won't know how to, how to vote. And he said, you know, there was a Warren Commission investigating the assassination of President Kennedy. And that was a bestseller. And it was on the news every night. So we've got to get a commission to see what was it that motivated the US government to do this in 1942. And then he said, you know, there's a, uh, another commission to study the Ohio National Guard in the killing of the students at Kent State. He said, we've got to do that. And Spark said, well, I've got a Native Hawaiian claims bill. Uh, and so I had a young, brilliant, wonderful legislative director by the name of Glenn Roberts. And Glenn Roberts' brother, Steve Roberts, was a reporter for the New York Times and then left New York Times went to CBS. But his wife, Steve's wife, is really well known, Cokie Roberts. And uh, so anyway, uh, Glenn took Sparky's bill and took pieces of it and pieced another bill. And that was called the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians. And so we got that bill passed President Carter signed the bill. Then he lost the election to President Reagan. President Reagan then appointed the members of the Commission uh, on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians. Mm -hmm. And now that was in the early 80s, yeah, that the commission started to, well, he signed yeah, they, in 1980. Yeah, that's right. They and the commission issued took, their report in 1980. 
Right. And, you know, and for those of us who remember that time, it was a time of great change and community involvement. I see my friends from NCRR nodding their heads, oh, heads here tonight. But, you yeah. know, certainly JACL and NCRR were very active in getting people to come out and to testify. And uh, we have some of the testimony upstairs. And the stories were, were very moving at that time. And, you know, um, what, what were your recollections of the hearings? I know you testified at the DC. Well, I used to go to uh, those commission meetings in Chicago, here in LA. And the first one was here in LA. And um, watching uh, three days of testimony from uh, Issei's, Issei's, and the, it just killed me to watch Issei women speaking in Japanese, telling about how their husbands committed suicide or they lost a child, and uh, even thinking about it today uh, tears me up. It was uh, tough watching those hearings. Uh, but the commission, after two years of study, came to the conclusion, yes, there was a gross violation of the constitutional rights of 120,000 people. And so, therefore, we recommend that the Congress issue an apology on, a, on behalf of the American people and make $20,000 redress payments. And uh, they said that the reason that the uh, evacuation and internment occurred is because of historical racial discrimination, uh, wartime hysteria, and the failure of uh, political leadership. And those three elements really apply today. Yes. And the, but in any event, uh, the commission then uh, issued their report. Glenn took that report of the, of the uh, Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians and wrote, again, the bill that eventually became H.R. 442. Right. I want to go back to something you just said, because I think it's incredibly important. Race prejudice, wartime hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. Those were the terms that the CWRIC identified as being the causes of the incarceration, the unjust incarceration and personal justice denied. And, and I think your, your comment is extremely critical. Race prejudice, wartime hysteria, a failure of political leadership. Does that describe 1942 or does it describe 2018? And I think you know, we, we could have another three hour discussion about that, but it, it raises some questions in terms of, and, and I know you well enough to know that when we say failure of political leadership, we're not just talking about one individual, we're talking about the whole system at this particular time. So I think that's one of the bits of the legacy I wanna get back to. But the other um, bit of trivia that you all need to know is that it was Glenn Roberts, it was your staff member who put pen to paper and crafted H.R. 442, or what eventually would become H.R. 442. Tell us a little bit about Glenn. Well, Glenn, um, was his family uh, was raised in New Jersey, and, um, and then he came down to D.C. after finishing college, and uh, I was fortunate enough to hire him as our legislative director. Just a very, very bright, uh, dedicated person. And uh, so I was going around trying to get co-sponsors of um, the first bill before it's known as H.R. 442. And uh, so I went to Jim Wright, the majority leader, and said, uh, this is what we're doing. And he said, put me on the bill. I said, Mr. Leader, usually the majority leader nor the speaker ever sponsor bills. No, he says, I fought in the South Pacific and I came home on, um, on uh, leave and found out what was happening with all these people in these camps. And I thought to myself, I'm not fighting over there for 
for something like this to happen. And he always thought to himself that he ever, if he ever had a chance, he would try to do something to correct what happened during World War II. So when, when I went to see him, and Glenn and I went to see him, and he says, put me on the bill. So you know, right away we go and reintroduce the bill, and first name we put on there is Mr. Wright. Uh, and because uh, it was really uh, unusual to have the majority leader uh, sign on as a co-sponsor. So Glenn and I walked out of his office, went down the hallway, turned right to go towards the elevator. We got in the elevator and the door closed and Glenn and I go, yeah! <laughs> we were just going crazy, but because, you know, we never ever thought we did. I just went to explain to him what we were doing. But he just said, put me on the bill. So, I mean, that was, he was a major, uh, it was a major uh, thing that he did in uh, putting his name on the bill. You know, Glenn once told me that once the bill was introduced in the 98th Congress and you started to lobby and, and try and get other co-sponsors, there came a point where you and, and the staff needed to believe that this was going to pass. It wasn't enough to pretend to believe. It wasn't pretend enough, or to, it wasn't enough to just hope. You had to believe in your hearts that this bill was going to pass. And I was going around to Republicans and Democrats to get, try to get them on the bill. And I went to Congressman Tom Kindness from Ohio, who was on the Rules Committee. The Rules Committee is very important because they're the ones who say, you know, we'll allow three amendments or. 20 minutes of time when they actually set the format for the discussion of legislation on the floor. So I went to Tom and I was explaining to him about the bill. And he said, yeah, you know, my boss told me something about that. I said, your boss? Who was your boss? And he said, he was the general counsel of um, international paper company, a fellow by the name of Carl Bendetson. I said, oh no. I mean, here Carl Bendetson and General John C. DeWitt were the two architects of the evacuation internment. It was General DeWitt who said, once a JAP, always a JAP. And he figured if they could attack Hawaii, they could attack the West Coast. And he figured, if they attack the West Coast, I know these people all join up with the Japanese military forces. And then in April, I think, of 42, there was a one-man submarine off the coast of Santa Barbara that fired some mm, shells in the Santa Barbara area. It caught some fires in that area. But there was such a total blackout of the news about that, the Japanese never knew that they had hit and caused some damage. And uh, so here, um, Tom Kindness talking about Carl Bendetz, and I thought, man, he was he and John, John DeWitt were the two architects. And that's when John DeWitt used Executive Order 9066 to commandeer fairgrounds and uh, county fairgrounds and racetracks because they had built-in living quarters, namely horse stables. Right. Now, when Glenn tells me that story, he tells me that you used a little bit more colorful language in describing uh, Tom uh, uh, Bedetson, but we won't share that here today. <laughs> when did you believe the bill could pass? Well, you know, it took us 10 years to get H.R. 442 passed. And I remember that first year out of the bill was something like H.R. 3582. But I wanted to use 442. So after each Congress, after every two years, any bill that isn't passed dies. So you have to reintroduce it. So I wanted to reintroduce the new bill or the same bill as H.R. 442, 
I was working with Charlie Johnson, the House parliamentarian, and I said, Charlie, I want this to be HR 442. So he said, okay, just wait here, and at the appropriate time, I'll tell you to drop the bill in, into the hopper. So I literally just stood there by the hopper at the beginning of the Congress, and at one point, Charlie said, drop the bill in. So I dropped the bill in, and pretty soon they stamped HR 442 on there, and we did that every two years for 10 years, to that uh, name alive as part of that bill. And we had Sam Johnson, a, a Democrat from Ohio, co-chair of the subcommittee on the Judicial Committee handling this bill. He had hearings, but he never liked the bill. He was against it, and he'd always talk about the Navy uh, uh, message. The magic cables. Magic cable. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he got appointed a federal judge by President Reagan. So then uh, Dan Glickman, a Democrat from Kansas, became the subcommittee chairman. He had hearings on it and moved the bill along. But he really wasn't sure he wanted to pass the bill out of subcommittee to the full Judiciary Committee to go to the floor. And then Dan got appointed Secretary of Agriculture. So then Bonnie Frank from Massachusetts became the subcommittee chairman. And I went up to Barney and congratulated him on becoming the subcommittee chairman. He says, yeah, Norm, we'll, and we'll get, you will get H.R. 442 passed. And that was the first time I ever thought, hey, maybe it'll really pass. And then Barney came back and said, I've got to have one more hearing to sort of clean up the elements of the bill. And I thought, oh, man, here we go again. But he did one hearing and then reported out of the bill to uh, the Judiciary Committee. Peter Rodino from uh, New Jersey was the chair of the Judiciary Committee, and he passed it right on to, this, to the House. And on September 17th of 1987, which was the 200th anniversary of the signing of the Constitution, uh, Majority Leader Jim Wright put the bill on the floor on that day. And he and the Speaker said, Norm, we want you in the chair, uh, chairing the House during the consideration of this bill. And that's why I got to sign that, what they call the red line copies. And you bill. gave an, a very impassioned plea that day on the floor of the House. We have excerpts of it upstairs in the exhibit where Norm talked about his own family's experience during the camps and then also what this bill meant, not only for the Japanese American community, but for America. What are your memories of that day on the House floor as the bill was being argued? Well, it was you know, really very emotional. And uh, is Mia Iwataki here? She's right over there. Huh? Mia, Mia, raise your hand. Stand up. <laughs> she, she is a driving force with NCR. Uh, who is the chair, Mia? Oh, Bert Nakano, of course. But so on the day the, f the, the bill was on the floor, uh, there was a fellow by the name of Rudy Tokiwa from uh, Sunnyvale, and uh, he was a 442nd veteran and uh, wounded terrible injuries to his leg. And so Rudy would come back to DC and call on members of Congress. And one of the people he called on was this congressman from Florida. And he'd go see uh, uh, Charlie Bliss. And uh, the two of them became very good friends. And the day the bill was on the floor, I went up to Charlie and I said, Charlie, uh, look upstairs and up in the right-hand gallery, uh, there's the Rudy Tokiwa in his wheelchair. Well, you're not supposed to, but Charlie waves at <laughs> Rudy and Rudy waves back. And uh, he never co-sponsored the bill. 
and as much time as we spent with Charlie to co-sponsor the bill, he wouldn't do it. And um, he had, uh, what do you call, uh, leg uh, crutches and, and leg thing. And uh, so uh, I was watching Charlie, and the vote is for 15 minutes. And then they opened it up for a little more time for votes. And then that first 15 minutes, Charlie still hadn't voted. So I went up and I reminded Charlie that Rudy's up there. He said, yeah, 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 I know, I know. So there was another 15 minutes. And towards that last 15 minute section, Charlie put his card into the machine, voted yes. And he turned around and looked up at Rudy. <laughs> and he waved yeah, again. He waved at him. <laughs> we have that story over at the Go For Broke exhibit, so please go over and visit it. For those of you who were here last night, I asked a trivia question. So if you were here, you're not allowed to answer this question. I'm going to give you five names of representatives that were on the floor of the House that day. So we have Normanetta, Bob Matsui, Barney Frank, Newt Gingrich, and Dick Cheney. Okay, so those are five individuals that were on the floor of the House who voted on this bill. Four of them voted for this bill and one of them did not vote in favor of this bill. Who was the one that did not vote in favor? Normanetta, Bob Matsui, Barney Frank, Dick Cheney, Newt Gingrich. Throw out some names. No, no, you know, so you, you don't, don't come here and act like you're the A student sitting in front and say, I read the book already. This is for the other people. How many people think it was Newt Gingrich did not vote for this bill? How many people think it was Dick Cheney that didn't vote for this bill? How many people think it was Barney Frank that didn't vote for this bill? And Bob Matsui, anybody think he didn't vote for the bill? Anybody think Normanetta didn't vote for the bill? Well, I'll tell you. Dick Cheney and Newt Gingrich, two very conservative Republicans, understood that this bill was about equal justice under the law. They voted for the bill. Barney Frank, the first openly gay member of Congress, a great proponent of redress, a friend to the Japanese American community, voted for this bill. Bob Matsui, Japanese American from Sacramento, ten, a six month old baby when he and his family were sent off to Tule Lake, voted for this bill. So what does that mean? There was one individual who did not vote. Now I didn't, mark, uh, note my words, I didn't say voted against the bill, I said did not vote in favor of this bill, but it was for a very principled reason. Take it away, Norm. Well, I voted to abstain uh, because here I am, co-author of the bill and that whole conflict of interest of, oh yeah, look at Manetta, he's promoting this bill so he gets his 20,000 bucks. So I abstained in the voting, and then when I did get my check, I gave it to the University of California, Santa Clara University, San Jose State, and the Japanese American National Museum. So I never saw the proceeds <laughs> of that. So you'll notice if you go upstairs, it does say, because we have all the in, uh, way people voted, and it will say, voted present, Mineta, right? So a very principled decision on this gentleman's part. But Norm, I got to ask you now, had the vote been 217 to 217, because there's 435 members of Congress, if the vote had been 217 to 217, what would you have done? <laughs> It's called Sepaku. <laughs> so the bill, the bill passes the House. And, and for those of you who haven't seen the exhibit yet, 243 members of Congress voted for this bill, in favor of this bill. 180 of them were Democrats, 63 of them were Republicans. It was truly a bipartisan effort then we're not even seeing anything close to that today. I mean, we can't even pass budget bills, let alone a bill like this. It goes on to the Senate, and we knew it was going to pass the Senate. What, were your, what was your thinking? And well, were, I went over to the Senate right, floor. You were there at the vote. I went over to the right. Senate floor to watch the debate and to, you know, and because, you know, Dan Inouye was a big 
proponent of the bill, of course, Spark Manzanaga was designated uh, to become the person in the chair when H.R. 442 was uh, being debated on the House floor. And uh, then my buddy, uh, Alan Simpson, was you know, helping out on uh, trying to get the, get the votes. But even Alan, in committee, voted against the uh, $25,000, $20,000 payment. But in the final analysis, even with that provision in the bill, he voted yes. But uh, no, it was, you know, it, we did the bill in September of 87 on the House floor. This is April of 1988, and the Senate passes the bill. And we had heard rumors, you know, that President Reagan may might uh, veto the bill. And uh, so there was a fellow by the name of Grant Ujifusa. Ujifusa family was from uh, Wyoming, and they never were interned. But Grant was at that point the senior editor of Reader's Digest. And he became the editor of Governor Kane of New Jersey when he wrote his life story. And, and Grant was the editor of that of uh, the uh, Senator, uh, Governor Kane's book on behalf of Reader's Digest. So Grant went to Governor Kane because we found out that President Reagan and Governor Kane were go going to be, get to be together on the, uh, in an automobile probably for two, three hours one day. So Grant went to Governor Kane and said, please talk to President Reagan about not vetoing the bill. And uh, Rose Ochi had written to the president to remind him that he was Captain Ronald Reagan of the US Army at Sergeant Masuda's funeral. Sergeant Masuda uh, from Orange County wasn't allowed to be buried in the cemetery owned uh, by the city and he had been killed in action uh, serving in Italy with the 442nd. So Rose had written to the president about reminding him that he was Captain Ronald Reagan <coughs> when they finally approved uh, Sergeant Masuda's burial. And uh, so <coughs> we were at the National JCL convention in Seattle on Tuesday, the White House announced that there will be a signing ceremony of H.R. 442, 10 o'clock Thursday morning. You could hear the sucking sound as everybody was leaving Seattle to fly back to DC for that signing, <coughs> signing ceremony. But uh, it was, it was really um, a moving ceremony. Have some candy. Mm. If you need to suck on some. <clears throat> so, so at the ceremony, you're up on stage. You're there with, you know, Senator Inoue Matsunaga. Bob Matsui was there. You're there with uh, um, Ted Stevens and Dan Young from Alaska. And Don, Don Young from Alaska, because. There was a provision for Aleutians <coughs> who had been evacuated from the Aleutian Islands because the Japanese were bomb, bombing and shelling uh, that area. What was going through your mind as you stood up there knowing that President Reagan was about to sign the piece of legislation that many of us for many years had thought was the impossible dream, that this would never happen, and yet you were moments away from it becoming law. Well, of course, the first thing I looked at when, as President Reagan was signing the bill, was the fact that my signature was there as Speaker Pro Tem. <coughs> so, to that extent, again, you know, it was just another emotional moment 
to see this legislation pass. After it passed, uh, and we were looking at how many people are now going to be recipients. And under the legislation, you had to be alive to receive the bill. And I don't know, there was a death rate of maybe 60, 100 people dying every year. So we were saying to the uh, um, Attorney General for President Reagan, please expedite these payments. And so the first woman to receive it was a woman from LA, 102 years old. And she flew back to DC and President Reagan's Attorney General presented her yes. the first check. Uh, but it, it was to have that happen. And you had to be alive to receive the payment. So we wanted to make sure that they tried to expedite these as fast as possible. Right. And in fact, there, in the two versions, the Senate version and the House version, there is even differences there where the Senate was saying you had to be alive on the day that you re, I mean, that you received the check, and then the House was saying you have to be alive on the day that uh, the bill was signed. And in, in the more inclusive and see the version. thing is, we were trying to figure out how much money do we have to have in the bill to make these payments. So we contacted a actuarial firm, and I asked them. There were roughly 120,000 people who were evacuated. So here, how many people would still be alive? And they thought, well, about 70,000. So we put in there enough money for 70,000. Turned out 81,000 were going to be recipients. They didn't realize that under the CSO, the Commissioner's Standard Ordinary Actuarial uh, Tables, they didn't recognize that Japanese were longer lived. And so we ended up with 81,000. And here we had built the money in for 70,000. So we had to take the money from the education fund and move it over to the, to the redress payment side in now, order to get people paid. Now let's talk about this and the, the clause that said you had to be alive on August 10th, because clearly that saved a great deal of money. But it also saved setting a precedent that I know certain people didn't want set, and that was the precedent of paying reparations to people who are no longer alive. And the concern was, of course, African-American slavery. Can you talk a little bit about that and how difficult that was a, of a decision that was uh, to include that in the bill? Well, there are two difficult decisions about the legislation. One was about this issue of payment and who receives it. Uh, and the other one was the Peruvians. The Peruvians were not included as H in H.R. 442. Uh, it was only for those who were residents of um, the United States. And yet President Roosevelt wrote to every president in North America, Central America, South America, saying, evacuate them. And in Mexico, there's a florist, big florist, called Casa de Matsumoto. And Mr. Matsumoto was a good friend of the president of Mexico. And he said, I will vouch for every Mexican Japanese. So Mexico never did uh, evacuate. Canada did. And the only other one was Peru. And Peru sent all their evacuees mm -hmm. to Crystal City, Texas. And uh, so it, it was tough to, to do that because the Peruvians were working, working really hard contacting us regularly to include them in the bill as well as, uh, and we didn't want to get involved with heirs and uh, the whole issue of, you know, the conflict between surviving heirs of a, of a decedent. And uh, so it was put in there that they had to be alive at the time of receiving their, 
right there, check. One other bit of trivia about the signing, for those of you who go and see the photo, if you look at the far right, you'll see a Japanese-American man by the name of Harry Kajihara. We all know who he is. And then directly to his right or to the left, the so second from the uh, end, is uh, a white American. And many people will look at that and say, who is that man? Do you know who I'm talking about? His Bill Lowry? Bill Lowry. And um, people look at that and say, we don't recognize who that is. And his name turns out to be Bill Lowry. And if you remember a few minutes ago, Norm was talking about a gentleman named Mike Lowry who had stepped up to help in the redress movement. Mike Lowry should have been invited to the signing, but Bill Lowry was invited by mistake and is, is in the uh, photo. Pete Wilson was in that bill also. Right. No, but Pete Wilson but, was invited to the yeah, signing, he, he right? He was invited, <laughs> and he did end up supporting the bill. Yes. And uh, and Spark and Patsy Psyche uh, were all there. You know, Dan never came up towards the front of the line. He was in behind. You could barely see the top of his head uh, in a lot of those right. shots that were taken. Any reason? Do you know the reason for that? Well, I think he did it out of respect for Spartan mm -hmm. Matsunaga. Mm -hmm. And you know, Dan was that way. Uh, there was nothing, he didn't have a selfish, egotistical boat in his body. And uh, if he hears Spark, Spark was the majority leader pro tem that day when the bill was considered on the Senate floor, and he uh, had Spark standing up front and Dan stood in the back. So what is the legacy of redress? What is the lesson for our nation and for our community? Well, to me, the th amazing thing about it is that this happened to 120,000 people. And sure, there were some people who were very bitter about this whole thing. but. To me, the amazing thing is that there isn't that kind of rancor and um, uh, that impacted 120,000 people, but a very, very strong conviction in the Japanese American community that something like this should never, ever happen again. And so to this day, uh, you know, we do. Uh, uh, Day of Remembrance ceremonies. And it's so important that we keep this, what happened, uh, on the surface to make sure it never happens. And I, you know, used to think, uh, history is not going to repeat itself. And yet on 9 11, uh, uh, I grounded all the planes. I was Secretary of Transportation for, Secretary, for President. George W. Bush, and the two planes had gone into the World Tower in uh, New York. And then the plane, I was in the bunker at the White House, and I had pulled three people out of ACS, Aviation Civil Security, at the FAA. And I said, look, come on over to my office and work on uh, the new security regimen by which we're going to let the airlines go back into the air and work with the deputy secretary and chief of staff, put a bill together. So that was Tuesday morning when they started. On Wednesday, I asked, call, how are you doing? And they said, well, and they showed me right at the top of the line, the first thing was no racial or ethnic profiling. And I thought, oh man, this is gonna be a tough one. But on Thursday, September 13th, we were having a cabinet meeting with the House and Senate, a Republican and a Democratic leadership. And towards the end of that meeting, Congressman David Bonnier from Michigan said, Mr. President, we have a very large population of Middle Easterners in Michigan, very large population of Muslims. And they're concerned about all the rhetoric in the print media and the electronic media about banning Middle Easterners from flying, banning Muslims from flying. And President Roosevelt, I'm President, 
President uh, Bush said, David, you're absolutely correct. We are equally concerned about all this rhetoric in the electronic and print media. But we don't want to have happen today what happened to Norm in 1942. I mean, you could have knocked me off my cabinet chair with a feather. And yet here was the President of the United States with this kind of compassionate concern. Denny and I had gone up to Camp David, you know, and the President gets sworn in 17th, I mean, the 20, 20th of January, 2001. I got confirmed as Secretary as for, on the 24th of January, 2001. And then in March, Denny and I were invited by the President to come up to Camp David. So we were up at Camp David, and during dinner hour, he says, hey, Norm, tell me about evacuation and internment. Now, here's a fellow who likes to go to sleep or go to bed relatively early. But here we were, quarter to 10 at night, still talking about evacuation and internment. And that was in March. And here in September 13th, he's saying to David, you're right, David. We are equally concerned, and we don't want to have happen today what happened to Norm in 1942. So here the president, you know, again, you know, the press really treated him like a doofus. But he was a decent, decent, good person, the kind of person you want to sit around the table and, and have a beer. Well, he doesn't drink. Uh, he still goes to AA meetings. But uh, so anyway, uh, here's this person who, in terms of equality and diversity, justice, uh, just came out and said that that day. And then um, he went to the Islamic Study Center on Monday, September 17th, met with a very large group of Middle Easterners and Muslims, and he says, we know, we know who did that last Tuesday. They were not loyal Arab Americans. They were not faithful followers of uh, the Muslim faith. Muslim faith. They were terrorists, and we're going to go after them. And then towards the end of September, there was a shooting in uh, Arizona, and uh, this fellow was shot and killed who owned a gas station with that mini mark attached to it. And when they apprehended the killer, they asked him, why'd you kill this guy? And the guy simply said, because he looked like the enemy. He was a Sikh. A turban, facial hair, leg bindings, and all he said was, because he looked like the enemy. So in October, uh, President Bush had a very large group of South Asian uh, Indian Americans and Sikhs to the White House to say, we will pursue all of these hate crimes. So uh, the president really was, I mean, he really showed his true colors. You know, I think those are some very moving stories and, and they demonstrate to all of us that you, you were the right man in the right place at the right time for our community as well as for our nation. And so for that, you know, I thank you, and I'm sure people in this room thank you. Thank you. Now, I, I know I could go on for hours more asking questions, and I don't want to jeopardize all the time. We do have some time for questions from the audience. So uh, are there any questions uh, to ask of, what was the name again? Pesky? <laughs> Representative Pesky from California. <laughs> Robert Hall. Robert. Yes. We have the mic coming to you. Yes. I have, I have two questions. Number one, what was President uh, Reagan's, uh, why wouldn't he uh, sign that bill? He said he might veto it. And the second one, would you come back and talk to us about your involvement in 9-11? I talked to your wife, and she said you might. <laughs> <laughs> um, the one on 
with President Reagan. Uh, why would he veto the bill? Why would he sign? Well, the, bill? the thing is that there was all this conversation about, you know, what do you do with John Conyers, Congressman Conyers of Michigan, had introduced a redress bill relating to uh, the um, slavery issue. And that was one of the important pieces of H.R. 442, where he had to be alive to receive the check. But Congressman Conyers' bill uh, related to slavery. Well, here you go back to 1850s. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, there was all that. You know, who's going to be next in terms of seeking some kind of uh, <clears throat> redress or uh, reparations for the acts of the government. Uh, and so there was a great deal of conversation about that, and um, which was the, the uh, sort of the conservative approach was what do you do? You know, we're gonna do this with Native uh, American Indians what about the black population, uh, others? So uh, there was a lot of conversation about the uh, possibility of a veto. And, uh, and but as I said, uh, Governor Kane and others really, really worked on President Reagan not to veto the bill. Now on 9-11, I was having breakfast that morning with the deputy prime minister of uh, Belgium, who also was the minister of uh, transport. And I had with me at that breakfast meeting, Jane Garvey, who was the head of Federal Aviation Administration. So we were having breakfast in my conference room and, and then my chief of staff came in, said, may I see you? So I excused myself, went from my conference room into my office, and at the end of the office, about where that wall is, TV council, and shows the Twin Towers, black smoke pouring out. So I said, what's that? He said, well, we don't know. We've heard the possibility of general aviation into the building. We've heard the possibility of commercial aviation. We've heard the possibility of an internal explosion in the building. So I watched TV for a little while, and I said, hey, John, I've got to get back in to, my, to the breakfast, keep me posted. So I went back in and explained to Mrs. Durant and Jane Garvey what I had just seen on television. Seven, eight minutes later, John comes in, said, may I see you? So I excused myself, went into the office, and said, it was an American Airlines that went into the World Trade Center. So I went up to the TV and I'm watching TV. Then all of a sudden across the screen comes this gray object and then disappears off the left side of the screen. And then there's just yellow, white, orange, billowy clouds coming out over here. I go, holy cow, what was that? Or words to that effect. <laughs> Pe pesky, pesky, you know. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, so then I really watched television for a little while. And uh, then I went back in and said, I don't know what's happening in New York, uh, Mrs. Duran, but I'm gonna, I know I'm gonna be involved somehow. Jane, you've gotta get back to the FAA Operations Center. So by the time I went back into my office, somebody had called from the White House saying, get over here right away. So I grabbed some manuals and papers and stuck them in my briefcase and went down to the car and we're going in West Executive Drive at the White House. People are running out of the old executive office building. They're running out of the White House. And I said to my driver in security, I said, is there something wrong with this picture? We're driving in and everybody's run, <laughs> running the other way. So I went in and uh, the guard at the gate said, uh, Mr. Smith is waiting for you in the situation room. So I went in there and he briefed me. And it wasn't much more than what I had already seen and heard on television. 
Then he said, you've got to be in the bunker. I said, well, where's that? And it's called the, uh, um, shoot, classified, no. Uh, well, anyway, it, it's a bunker about way under the White House. Uh, they say it's nuclear bomb proof. I hope we never have to test it. But anyway, uh, I said, I have no idea where, where it is. The Secret Service agent was standing there, says, I'll take you. So they took me down there. I got there about 9.20, and uh, there's a big, long table, about 40 feet long, 15 feet wide, chairs all around the table. And between each of the chairs are phones. So this phone I set up with my uh, to the uh, office. I said, keep the line open, don't hang up. This phone I set to the operations center at Federal Aviation Administration, don't hang up. So I used those two phones and uh, from then until six o'clock that night. And uh, pretty soon a military assistant came in to see uh, Vice President Cheney, who was on the other side of the table. And he said, there's a plane coming towards DC. So on the phone, I said to Monty Belger, the number two at FAA, I said, Monty, what do you have on radar uh, of a plane coming towards uh, DC? And he said, well, we're tracking one plane and the transponder has been turned off. So all we're doing is following the blip, the white blip on the radar set. But it's hard to look at a radar monitor and relate it to a point on the ground. So when I said, well, where is it? He said, well, I'm not sure, maybe a uh, middle part of central Pennsylvania. Every so often I'd say, where is it now? Uh, probably north of Baltimore. Where is it now? Uh, somewhere between um, uh, Arlington, Roslyn, and uh, National Airport. Where is it now? Uh, somewhere between Pentagon City and National Airport. Oops. Oops, oops what? Uh, Mr. Secretary, we just lost the bogey. We just lost the target. What do you mean you lost the target? Where'd you, where'd you lose it? Somewhere between the Pentagon City, the shopping area, and National Airport. Then someone broke into the phone line and said, Mr. Secretary, we just got word from an Arlington County police officer who saw an American Airlines go into the Pentagon. And I said to Monty, I said, Monty, that's the third airliner in the last hour and a half that's been used as a missile. And I said, in the military, they have a stand down where they bring everything to a screeching halt and try to extract some element of what went on, the, what's going on to figure out what's going on. So I said, we've got to do our own stand down. So I said, bring all the planes down. He said, Monty had been a air traffic controller when he started 27 years ago. He says, bring all the planes down per pilot discretion, which is what air traffic controllers say. And I said, Monty, screw the airline pilots. Bring all the planes down. Because I didn't want to pilot over Albuquerque, New Mexico, Phoenix, or somewhere, deciding I want to sleep in my own bed. I'm going to go fly on into L.A. And so I said, well, I want to get all the planes down. Well, at that point, we had 6,438 airplanes over the United States at the time. And in an hour and 20 minutes, all of those planes were down on the ground safely without incident. And about quarter to 10 in the morning, I called Minister David Collinette, the Minister of Transport in Canada. I said, David, I need your help. He says, well, we're watching on television what's happening down under, uh, down there, what do you need? I said, I've got planes coming in from Europe, coming in from Asia. Those that have, haven't reached the halfway point, we've sent them back. But those that have gone beyond the halfway point are heading towards the US and I don't wanna take them. Can you take them in Canada? 
So Canada has a privatized air traffic control system. So he said, let me check. And he put me on hold. In less than two minutes, he came back. We'll take them all. In the September, David came to DC and brought with him a picture of the airport at Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia. Little airport, population about five, 6,000 people. No hotels, some hotels. But by 5 o'clock that afternoon, population in, in Halifax was now 10,200. And so they opened up church social halls, school auditoriums. People even opened up their own homes to have people come and stay with them. And it was, this picture he brought showed 53 single aisle and double aisle planes at this little airport in Halifax, Nova Scotia, parked wingtip to wingtip, nose to tail, 53 little, I mean 53 big airplanes at this little airport. I went back in 2016, the 50th anniversary, our fifth anniversary, and ran into this couple. He was from London. She was Houston. They were uh, celebrating their third wedding anniversary in uh, Halifax. They met five years ago and got married. And here they were celebrating their third wedding anniversary. In, uh, so in not only did you uh, keep us safe, but you brought a couple together <laughs> and facilitated love in Canada. Great story. Uh, Cortland, go ahead. Who do you have? Hi, my name is Cindy Kishiyama from Arizona, and I was just wondering, uh, there was a friend of mine who is a lawyer, now he's a judge in Arizona, and he said that during the time that they were signing up people right after um, your bill passed and President Reagan signed and everything, he said a lot of the essays would not come forward. He said a lot of them were so embarrassed that they kept going, she got to nine, no, 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 okay, no, it's okay, it's okay. You know, I'm just wondering if that happened like nationwide, do you know, or was it just in Arizona where they were like, I don't think so. No, I think uh, <clears throat> most people who were alive, uh, received their checks. There were very few who uh, didn't receive their checks. Uh, and there was, you know, a young fellow by the name of Robert Bratt, who was with the uh, uh, Department of Justice and in charge of, the, in charge of the repayment program. And uh, so I said to uh, Bob, I said, Bob, you know, you're so popular you really could run for president of the United States and be elected. Problem is, who wants a brat for president? <laughs> but Bob Bratt was just, Mia, did you ever meet him? It wasn't he great, but he was the one who was just a bulldog to make sure that they expedited these payments because uh, there were the number of people who were passing away. And, you know, they'd be within maybe two, three days of receiving their check, and uh, but Bob was just terrific. I can verify what uh, Secretary Mineta is saying, because I interviewed the Office of Redress Administration, and they reported that very few people returned their checks or denied their checks, even though there had been some who said that they were going to do that. And I know that there are people in the audience here today, Mia Iwataki, uh, Kei Ochi, and Ron Wakabayashi, who work closely with Bob Bratt at the Office of Redress Administration. So you may want to ask them, because I know they have some wonderful stories about not only how uh, the Office of Redress Administration distributed the checks, but how they expanded the interpretation of the act to include more people. There were different categories of individuals who were added who otherwise would not have received their redress and the apology. So. We are running out of time, and again, I think I speak on behalf of everyone in this room as well as on behalf of our community and our nation. Okage sama de. Because of you, we are. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you for being here.
I hope you can stick around a little while. I'm sure people are going to come up and have a lot of questions or simply want to shake your hand. But on behalf of the Japanese American National Museum, on behalf of Go For Broke National Education Center, we thank you. We thank Denny for coming out with you. And we thank all of you for joining us here this afternoon. Thank you very much. Stick around a little bit longer.